Hi everybody, welcome to The Court Order. Today I am so excited to talk about the protection that is asylum law. There's multiple types of immigration petitions, family-based, employment-based. Today we're gonna to talk about a fear-based humanitarian relief. So what is asylum law? Asylum law, again, is a fear-based humanitarian claim. The history of it, um, it started right after the Holocaust. The United Nations came together and they created a legal document called the 1951 uh, Refugee Convention. And what this convention did was it provided an international stamp that said that all parties to the United Nations, that means all countries who are part of the United Nations, must provide a protection to refugees, meaning that a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face a serious threat of harm um, to their life or to their freedom. And this is an international protection, not just specific to the United States. Fast forward to 2019, and we see that asylum law is still an international protection that's mandated uh, by international law. In 1951, when that convention was created, the demographic that was in mind were the people and victims of the Holocaust. Well, now we still see people who are fearful of their lives if they're returned to their home country. And so these people also need the protections of asylum. So does everyone qualify for asylum? In the United States, absolutely not. Um, the process is extremely stringent. Uh, there are five basic elements that every asylum applicant must demonstrate in order to be granted a petition of asylum. But a well-founded fear of persecution, and then we have to identify the persecutor. Um, so if the persecutor is a government actor, meaning we have a government agency, maybe a police officer or a police unit, or we have a presidency, um, we use that to determine what the requirements are next. If it's a government agency, we have to demonstrate that the government agency will continue to persecute them. But if we have a private actor, um, for example, some of the cases are based in domestic violence or they're based in some form of criminal group that's not affiliated with the government. Um, and so what we have to show is not only will they face this well-founded fear or do they have this well-founded fear of persecution, but that the government is unable or unwilling to protect them. So it isn't enough just to demonstrate that this person has a well-founded fear of persecution and it's not enough to just identify the persecutor and to identify that the government is unable or unwilling to protect them and that they have sought out the help of their government um, previously. We also, or the applicant also needs to demonstrate that the persecution that they faced or that they will face is on account of a protected grounds. And Unless the protected grounds is provided for in asylum law uh, via case law or via the Immigration Nationality Act, uh, that person stands to not qualify for asylum. Um, five bases or five grounds by which a person can experience persecution and qualify for asylum is that of persecution based on race, based on their religion, based on their nationality, based on their political opinion, whether it be explicit or imputed, um, meaning that they had this particular political opinion or that this political opinion was um, placed on them based on societal views and that they experienced persecution because of this. Or the fifth, uh, which is kind of what some consider a catch-all, but membership in a particular social group. Again, um, we're considering applicants who face persecution because they're members of the LGBTQ community. Uh, we also see applicants who are facing persecution because um, they will be subjected to being victims of female genital mutilation. And that's not something that's necessarily accounted for by race or religion or nationality or political opinion. It could be, but it's because of their membership in this particular social group that they will face or have faced persecution, right? And so with that being said, we have to demonstrate that not only is their membership in this particular social group um, something that's evident, but it has to be socially visible, it has to be particular to them, um, and that the persecution that they faced was because uh, the persecutor viewed them as being in this group. We've seen a lot of challenges, especially under this current administration, uh, for certain claims. Claims that are family-based fears. Um, that means if my father um, was 
experience persecution and I am his daughter, um, I would also be subjected to that same persecution because of our relationship. And what we've seen is that those claims have been challenged and that in order for people to apply for asylum or to qualify for asylum, they themselves have to have experienced persecution. Um, and so a lot of adjudicators, a lot of asylum uh, advocates and humanitarian um, uh, professionals are, are fighting against this type of case law. Um, there's also a challenge against domestic violence based claims. Um, there is an argument, of course, that's continuing to circulate that says that asylum was not created to protect people from domestic violence or domestic violence claims. And that includes not just um, partner to partner, romantic partners, but also children, children who face uh, domestic violence uh, from parents or other family members that's been challenged. We've also seen um, gang resistance or criminal group resistance be challenged in all over the nation. And so this one is particularly um, notable because we see this type of claim um, from the Central American or Northern Triangle area. So that includes not just Mexico, but also El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And so a lot of advocacy groups are saying that these particular laws target a certain demographic. And the goal is to not just limit asylum claims, but to limit asylum claims from a certain applicant. Um, there are lots of bars to asylum, one of them being a one-year filing deadline. Within one year of your entry to the United States, you need to file an application. This makes it difficult for a lot of applicants. The next question I get very, very often is, how does this affect me? Um, and so we've seen in the news that you can't get past the issue of immigration. You just can't. Uh, this administration has very clearly done what it can or what it could to prevent immigrant communities from entering the United States. It's also very evident that this administration is doing what they can to make sure that immigrant communities that are currently in the United States, whether they're here through some process afforded by the Immigration Nationality Act or in some other way, their goal is to get them out of the United States and to use their outing as a, a deterrent for other communities to enter. So deportation and detention are the two biggest ways that we're seeing that happen. And so we've also seen in the news lots of raids, um, raids that are, have been planned by Immigration Customs and Enforcement. And so what we've been seeing is um, ICE go into facilities, working facilities, or communities where we know that there are lots of immigrant communities um, detaining these persons and then putting them on trial, detaining them for long periods of time as ways to deter immigrant communities from remaining in the United States as a way of separating families in another way, not just at the border, but internally, and, and then to, to later deport them. The next question that I get from many people, and I appreciate this question, is what they can do to help. So there are four things that I always suggest. The first thing that I suggest is having people talk to, of course, these wonderful nonprofits and great immigration attorneys who can help people plan for the worst. And that sounds terrible, but you have to in this current climate. So cliche to say, this current climate. Um, one thing that um, all of the organizations that I've worked for, that I've been blessed to work for, work on two things. The first um, are Know Your Rights presentations. There are lots of aids through bigger organizations like the American um, Civil Liberties Union, where they provide Know Your Rights information in multiple languages so that immigrant communities know what to do when they're faced with um, governments um, entering their homes, their workplaces, or if they're separated, all of those instances so that they can know their rights very plainly and in their own language. Another thing that I've been really blessed to be exposed to is that of a family emergency preparedness plan. Uh, recently, there was one of the biggest raids and that we've seen in the United States for a very long time in Mississippi, and lots of children were left on the first day of school in gym auditorium, spending the night eating pizza and not knowing where their families were. Um, children were filmed crying on the news, and there was no indication as to what to do. Um, one thing that we walk all of our clients through, and one thing that we always prepare them for is an emergency preparedness plan. Basically, having the family walk through what happens if this happens. Financially, what do we do? What is our plan? Who is our immigration attorney? Who do we have pick up the kids? It's a scary and awful plan, but it's one that 
we have our clients prepared for. And so that's one thing you can do to help, pointing them to nonprofits. I always suggest going to a nonprofit first. Um, if the nonprofit can't take them, at least they can give them a list of people, really good attorneys who will do right by these communities and not exploit them so that they can go about doing getting know your rights information and also emergency preparedness plans. The next thing or the third thing is that they can call their local representatives. It's really important that you go to council meetings or local meetings. It's important that you call your local representative. It's important that you vote and understand your rights um, and the rights of the local communities, but that you encourage them and, and honestly hold them to the fire, that they're supposed to be supporting bills and doctrine that will support immigrant communities. Um, the final thing, of course, is supporting nonprofits. I mentioned earlier that you refer people to these nonprofits who can un help people understand their rights. Um, and these nonprofits also are really great at helping people understand if they qualify for humanitarian claims, not just asylum, but all claims. It's also important to support them. Most of these groups have volunteer databases. They have um, funding if you can afford it. They also have... At, um, organizing, community organizing, and other things that you can do to partner while you refer people, also support them.